Welcome to Money Talks, a series of interviews with me, Liam Halligan, Economics and Business Editor of GB News. In this episode, I talk to Patrick Minford, Professor of Economics at Cardiff University. During the Conservative Leadership Contest, when Liz Truss was asked to name any economists who backed her plans, she replied, Patrick Minford. Previously based at Liverpool University, Minford made his name as one of the monetarists who revolutionised economic thinking in the late 1970s and early 80s. His Liverpool model of the economy was based on rational expectations, the idea people make decisions based on available information and learn from past experience, which became a popular explanation of why high inflation is hard to shift. Back then, after 364 economists wrote to the Times attacking the 1981 budget as deflationary, Minford wrote a letter contradicting them, and later became an advisor to Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. Now 79, Minford agrees with Truss that tax cuts are needed to prevent the economy sliding into recession. He's encouraged the incoming Prime Minister to face down the Treasury and give stronger economic growth a higher priority than immediately reducing the national debt. Patrick Minford, great to have you here on Money Talks once again. My pleasure, Liam. What are your thoughts on the state of the British economy now as the new Prime Minister enters Downing Street? I think the prospects are good. Um, if we can get policy right, uh, obviously we've got various elements in the situation at the moment. We've got an overhang of planned tax rises, which have never made any sense. And then we've got the cost of living crisis where uh, the the right thing to do is to index um, benefits and tax thresholds to inflation. They go up as inflation goes up automatically. Yes, that's right. That's what should happen. And if that happens, then the economy is not affected by the inflation because it's indexed to to the things that affect people, namely their taxes and their and their benefits. And that was always the in intention of the tax system. But it it's been it's been stopped for the moment by the budget decision not to index um, tax thresholds or um, well benefits continue to be indexed. But of course, the the immediate problem is that inflation is much higher than forecast, and so the fact that there's no indexing going on means that taxes are going up very sharply uh, on. Um, wages that are actually falling in real terms. So that's that's called completely wrong. So the first the first thing that's got to be done is actually to offset that um, and deal with the so-called cost of living crisis, which this has produced. And that means, I think, something that happens quickly in real time, which is something like a cut in VAT to offset the effect of the non-indexation on people's taxes, and also um, accelerated um, raising of benefits to to match the inflation that's going on, and and both those two things I think will deal with the so-called cost of living crisis, and that that's an important first step at the moment that needs to be to me to be taken to to put the economy back on an even keel. Professor Minford, you've broadly backed the policies of Liz Truss during this leadership contest. She wants to reverse the corporation tax increase. She wants to reverse the national insurance increase. She wants to lower taxation more generally. In a nutshell, why do you think Liz Truss is right and Rishi Sunak is wrong? Well, the main objective of economic policy is to maximise the welfare of the ordinary citizen. And that means putting growth first. And we know from an awful lot of research including work we've done on the UK economy, that the, the tax system has a big effect on growth. It's the so-called endogenous growth. I mean, growth actually results from good policies and good institutions. And so one of the things that you've got to get right is the tax system. And so Liz Truss's program is going to get the tax system back on track as a pro-growth uh, mechanism. And then what the Treasury has done is to say, oh, no, you can't do that because of borrowing constraints. But this is getting everything the wrong way around. 
I mean, borrowing is an important instrument to allow you to get taxes right. And then what you do about debt is you keep your debt ratio in the long run falling to a safe level. And that's what we've done for centuries, actually, and it's given us our good reputation in markets. So the Treasury's short-term rules have actually been preventing good tax policies. And what Liz Truss is proposing is to, is to get the tax policies right for growth, uh, which is what maximizes the welfare of the ordinary citizen. And then make sure that the debt ratio is coming down in the long term by, by fitting state spending to our available tax revenues as they come in. And if, if we do produce more growth, of course, it's impossible to know how much extra growth we will produce, but we'll, we will definitely produce some. That will improve the tax revenues and mean that we shouldn't have too bad a problem in terms of, uh, of, of our state spending that's also ne necessary for the, for the long-term future of the economy. What are your issues with Rishi Sunak's program? He's a very financially sophisticated man. He's clearly um, studied economics very, very closely. He says we do need to look after our public finances a lot more. Otherwise, financial markets will rebel. Isn't there a danger of that, Professor Minford? No, I don't think so. If you look at the financial markets and their behavior in the face of British debt, they've been astonishingly calm for a very long time. And our, our current interest rates simply reflect expected future interest rates that are needed to, to bring down inflation, which is entirely logical. And they, they have, of course, been, been very low for a long time during this period of the, the COVID um, crisis and pandemic, when actually uh, the real interest rate adjusting for inflation has been negative. And it, it's still actually negative. It's just um, a little bit less negative than it has been because interest rates are likely to have to rise to deal with inflation. I mean, the Bank of England really should be raising rates now and is starting to do so. Back in the 1970s, people talked about the gnomes of Zurich, didn't they? The sort of financial markets stopping us doing from doing what we want to do. We had obviously the UK going to the International Monetary Fund in the mid 1970s, cap in hand. Is it alarmist to talk about those kind of possibilities in our current situation, Patrick? Well, I think it's ridiculous, actually. I mean, we're one of the safe havens of world debt markets. I mean, it's completely absurd. Um, and we've always been an extremely reliable country to lend money to, as you can see, going back to the Napoleonic Wars, when our debt ratio was much higher than it is today. It was nearly over 200% of GDP, and similarly after World War II. And of course, over a long period, we've always brought our debt ratio down to safe levels of around 50%. And that will happen again. It'll just, it's ridiculous to say that we have to uh, get the debt ratio down immediately or in the next five minutes. This is nonsense. And of course, the, 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 the rejection of what, you know, the, this whole business of, of, of our of, of markets of losing confidence as us is perfectly clear from the COVID epidemic when we actually, a pandemic, when we actually raised 300, we raised 500 billion in debt at, at very low interest rates. So if, if we were going to have a debt crisis, we would have had it then. So the idea that a few tens and tens of billions now when to stop us putting up taxes in, in a way that would be very damaging to the economy is going to alarm markets is absurd. Of course, you've got to remember that the, the gnomes of Zurich time was when we were on fixed exchange rates and we had a fixed exchange rate to the dollar. It was a very different situation. And You mean in the late six, in the late six, the late sixties? Yes, of course, we've, we got rid of all that since then by floating. We have a floating exchange rate and we allow markets to determine, uh, we, we have the Bank of England determining interest rates um, nowadays uh, independently with an inflation target, and the pound floats in response to the environment we're in. Of course, we have power to set both our fiscal policy and our monetary policy, and the markets then adjust to that. And of course, they're completely calm about the UK, as, 
as why wouldn't they be, given that enormously long history of being a safe haven? And we are still a safe haven. So all this talk just misunderstands the situation we're in today and how, uh, and how markets work, basically. Establishment commentators, institutions are going to disagree with you. They're going to disagree with Liz Truss, aren't they? The, the Treasury, uh, the Office of Budget Responsibility, more than likely the Institute for Fiscal Studies. Do you think Rishi Sunak has been captured by the Treasury, his, his thinking, his, his intellectual independence? Do you think that's where he's gone wrong, Professor Minford? Yes, I do. I mean, what, what research uh, shows is that growth matters. And actually, um, if, if we can get growth returning to the UK economy by good policies, then, of course, that will encourage inward investment and uh, that in turn will improve our, uh, our, general, um, our general balance of payments position. And, uh, of course, if at the same time we can get on and, do, um, and pursue our free trade agenda, then that will make matters even better because we'll get away from all this protectionism that the EU has foisted on us. And so, yes, I think Rishi Sunak has just completely failed to understand what um, modern research is telling us. And the, the, this whole treasury orthodoxy is really a sort of harking back to, to a fearful past where uh, there was no confidence in the possibility of Britain running its affairs efficiently and uh, generating growth. Of course, if you go back to the 80s, we had quite successful growth policies and a lot of a lot of supply side reforms. And that was a period of great success in the economy. And I think since then, we've, we've kind of slid away from a lot of that. We, a lot of that has been reversed. I mean, regulation has become much more intrusive, thanks to the EU mainly. And taxes have been allowed to get higher and higher with marginal tax rates at quite dangerously high levels, culminating in the latest huge intellectual era of suggesting that corporation tax should go up to 25%, um, which, is, which is completely absurd and highly damaging since one of the key places we're going to get growth from is from innovation by businesses. And if you, if you put a big tax on that, you're going to reduce the rate of productivity growth. And so I think that this whole sort of sort of sort of second project fear really coming out of the treasury is has no basis in research or the way in which markets work are you worried about the pound the pound's lost 14 percent of its value against the dollar this year professor minford almost six percent in august alone isn't that a signal perhaps the treasury would say that we're overspending we're mismanaging our economy well, I think these, these people will clutch at all sorts of straws. And um, it's totally, I mean, again, this is a market phenomenon, very largely led by the strengthening of the dollar as its interest rates have been aggressively raised in world markets, you know, because the Fed has been taking a much more aggressive line on inflation than other central banks. And that has driven up the dollar. And if you look at our trade weighted uh, exchange rate, it hasn't really moved very much. And uh, so I think that, you know, what we're seeing here is the clutching at straws of all sorts. I mean, just the other day, the FT led on a story that the rate of interest had gone up to about 3% on long-term gilts. <laughs> but of course, it would, wouldn't it? Because we're all expecting the Bank of England to, to raise interest rates to about 3%. So it'd be pretty crazy if long-term gilts didn't reflect that. And that's not a crisis. That's simply the markets working normally. So a lot of this sort of, and another thing that has been flagged up is how, because we've got high inflation, we've got lots of higher interest payments, and that's a real threat to the public finances. This, of course, is pure nonsense, because the whole point about inflation is it reduces the value of your debts in terms of the real resources you pay. Even if the debt's index linked, Patrick, as quite a lot of our it debt is. is. Indeed, because on index linked, you, we're paying a negative real rate of interest. And what's... What the indexing does is it means we pay, we pay interest uh, equal to the inflation rate, which exactly offsets the falling value of the debt to debt holders. 
Um, and so what it means is that actually inflation completely washes out in the case of index-linked debt. This is pure intellectual error. And it's been this sort of nominal plucking of some figures out and putting them in the, in the accounts and saying, oh, they're going up, completely fails to understand the way in which inflation affects the public accounts. You know, I mean, real the, the point about index-linked debt is that they are set up so that inflation doesn't affect the real value of them. And to pretend that they do is, is simply um, intellectually um, ridiculous and shows, a, shows an attempt to, to, to kind of hoodwink ordinary people who don't understand these things with sort of uh, nonsense. I, I'm staggered by how illiterate these remarks are from uh, major organs of, of, of you know, economic opinion. What are your concerns, Professor Minford, about the economic outlook for in the coming months? What could go wrong? What do you want to make sure we avoid in order to try and maintain a decent cost of living for the vast bulk of our population? Well, I think we have to grasp the way, the way in which inflation is actually distorting taxes and benefits. And that's the first thing. We need a package which actually stops inflation, cutting benefits and raising taxes. And that's the first element that has to be done in the so-called cost of living crisis, because the whole point of indexing taxes and benefits to inflation is to make sure inflation doesn't affect people's living standards. But by not indexing taxes, tax thresholds, which is what the present government has has decided, it's actually making inflation reduce people's, ordinary people's living standards by raising taxes legitimately. And also, of course, benefits. I mean, that they haven't actually changed the indexation of benefits. But of course, in real time, inflation is going up faster than the benefits are being indexed. So mm. there has to be action to, to make sure that in real time, benefits are uprated so that um, they're kept constant in real terms as close as we can. Of course, normally we lag these indexations, but of course, at the present time, we need to, we need to speed that all up. And that's why I think that the, the biggest worry at the moment is that we'll be tipped into recession by this failure to deal with the way in which inflation is impacting on taxes and benefits. Patrick, just on a historic note, you really shot to prominence outside of academia at the time of the 1981 budget. You had a big group of 365 economists there who opposed Margaret Thatcher and Geoffrey Howe's 1981 budget. You supported it and said it was, would be fine. Is there an inconsistency between your position then and your position now? Because back then you were arguing for a lot more budgetary restraint, whereas your opponents were arguing for a lot more fiscal expansion. In the current context, that situation seems to be reversed, or is that to misinterpret? Well, I think the, the point really is that the situation today is totally different from um, the situation in 1981, um, because in 1981, inflation was still out of control, and there was no control of, there was no independent Bank of England controlling the money supply. And the only, the only, um, the only institution that was going to restore control of inflation was the government. And so effectively, um, the, Mrs. Thatcher was the only game in town to get hold of inflation. And the, the way in which people were concerned at that time with this endemic inflation close to 20%, they were concerned that the government wouldn't actually control the money supply and wouldn't control its finances. And if it didn't control its finances, they thought it was very unlikely that it would control the money supply. And so what happened was that um, the 1981 budget was uh, a signal to markets that the government meant business in the control of money and inflation. And that was why it was vital at the time. And of course, the moment that the 81 budget took place, 
market confidence in the future of inflation improved enormously and long-term interest rates dropped quite rapidly and it enabled the economy to recover. And so that was the situation then. But you see the situation today is completely different. I mean, we have an independent Bank of England, which is actually mandated to control inflation and is now, I think, having been a bit slow off the mark, doing that by raising rates. And it has already achieved quite a substantial tightening of money. And so the need today is actually for the bank to do its, to, to carry out its policies of uh, monetary control. And it will do that more effectively and with greater confidence if the, the fiscal policy of the government, which today can be a completely separate matter, it couldn't be in those days because of all those the way it was all tied up in, in the market's minds. It can be today because we've got this new situation. And actually, if fiscal policy is leaning against recession, that enables the Bank of England to operate with greater freedom to raise rates. And that in turn increases the credibility of the Bank of England and indirectly brings down inflation because people know that the bank is free to do what's needed. And so that improves confidence in markets that inflation will be brought under control. And that, um, in turn, reduces inflation. And of course, um, indirectly means that the bank hasn't got to be so fierce in raising interest rates. So what, what happens in, in these uh, environments where expectations are so important is that the role of fiscal policy becomes one of supporting the economy, and that in turn strengthens the freedom of monetary policy to do what needs to be done to control inflation. And I think people just haven't understood that, and that's why they sort of say in a sort of mindless way, oh gosh, if you, if you, if you, if you kind of stop the recession going on, you're going to feed inflation. On the contrary, it enables the Bank of England to do what needs to be done to control inflation. Finally, do you fancy a job back in government, Professor Minford? No, not at all. I, I'm an academic, and you know, I, I, it's, I, I, the, the, what I'm saying really comes out of my academic research, and you know, I've been researching on how the economy works for for many years, and I don't want to, I don't really want to give it up, um, and it's it's quite important to me, and I, I've got a big team of researchers. Uh, around me, who, 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 and we work together to, to do, um, to, to, to model the economy and to kind of work out how these things interact. I mean, I think one of the things that's come out of our research is, uh, and, and what we found from looking at the economy since the financial crisis, is that fiscal policy is really much more important as an independent instrument than people have. Mm. Um, have realized. And also, of course, endogenous growth, as it's called, you know, where uh, it's really important that, that the government is able to use the tax instruments to promote growth. And unfortunately, what, what we found from all this research is that, you know, um, in a curious way, uh, the Treasury has got religion from something 40 odd years ago, uh, you know, which is completely inappropriate today, as as we've just been discussing. And so it's a curious situation that in 1981, the conventional wisdom was that you should just not worry at all about fiscal or monetary policy. You should just have an incomes policy and let the public finances and money supply go to hell in a handcart. And today, it's curious that the very same profession that was so keen on that has now turned turned 180 degrees and is saying, no, 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 we must be frightfully austere and stop anything happening to fiscal and uh, fiscal policy. Uh, it's it's a very extraordinary reversal, and of course, both these positions are totally wrong. And I think you know, uh, I, I'm I, I'm going to just try and do my research and talk about it and. Uh, you know, argue with people about these things, and that's that's really 
I'm, I'm better fitted to that than I am to anything in government. <laughs> Professor Patrick Minford, thanks a lot for appearing on Money Talks. Good to talk to you as ever. Nice to talk to you, Liam. Thanks a lot for listening to Money Talks with me, Liam Halligan, Economics and Business Editor of GB News. If you've enjoyed this episode, then please leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, YouTube or wherever you're listening. Do subscribe to this podcast and also check out my daily television show, On The Money, at 1pm Monday to Friday on GB News or via the GB News app. GB News, Britain's news channel.